there and welcome to the Secrets of Organ Playing podcast. I'm your host, Vidas Pinkavichus. Today's guest is Dr. Dan Cook, who is um, AGO, the National Counselor for Education. And um, he serves as an organ faculty of Brigham Young University uh, in Provo, Utah, since 1991. In that capacity, he has blended multimedia with traditional one-on-one instruction in teaching beginning organ instruction to well over 5,000 pianists. Prior to that time, he held full-time organist positions at First United Methodist Church in Lubbock, Texas, and at Christ Church Cranbrook, Bloomfield Hills, Michigan. He received bachelor's and master of music degrees from BYU and the DMA from the University of Kansas and holds the associates uh, certifications of um, American Guild of Organists. So in this uh, conversation, uh, Dr. Uh, Cook uh, uh, shares his insights about uh, how to attract new audiences uh, uh, for the organ profession. And specifically, he created um, uh, the new organist web page with uh, free online videos. So I hope you will learn a lot from this conversation how technology can help us educate new members of, of the organ profession and uh, move forward into the 21st century. Let's go to the show. So, Dan, I'm so glad to, to be able to finally talk to you uh, via internet. Uh, I was hoping to have these conversations for many months now, and finally we're talking face-to-face. Thank you so much. You're very generous, and uh, welcome to the show. Well, thank you. It's great to be here, and I'm, uh, it's been difficult to get together, but finally July has come, June is gone, and uh, we have time. Great. And um, how was Houston, of course? Uh, can you tell us a little bit what you experienced and uh, what uh, did you present about in Houston, the AGO convention? The convention itself, I think, was fantastic. The, it was very well prepared by the, uh, by the committee and uh, very well planned. Uh, there were so many things offered every hour. Uh, excellent concerts in the evening. Uh, world-class performers and uh, uh, instruments just everywhere. Beautiful instruments in Houston. And I think everyone had a great time. I think if anything stood out, it was the overwhelming presence and and uh, influence of the young organists. They were very, very, uh, very much there and very interested. And we all felt a renewal of life, I think, during the Houston Convention. Right, uh, of course, uh, every every member of a, of the AGO uh, probably uh, hope is to be there, right? But not everyone is able to to uh, to travel that that far, for example. But of course, uh, you made this uh, great presentation. Can you tell us a little bit uh, what did you talk about in Houston? Well, uh, one of my main responsibilities as the counselor for education, of course, is to educate and. We have uh, targeted in the last year uh, to work towards educating the the new organist. And so what I did during this presentation is present a brand new web page that we've been working on uh, throughout the year uh, to bring new organists into the AGO, basically, to bring them into fellowship with people who would like to help them. To uh, The page itself can teach them a few little snippets about organ playing, give them a few perspectives that they need on their own, uh, show them how to find a teacher and so forth. It's, it's, uh, it's new, so it's, it's going to have more resources in the next year than it has now, but there are useful resources right now. Right, and of course, the AGO being such a fantastic institution for uh, for promoting the art of organ across the the ages, and it's global, right? You can be a member of European chapter of other uh, con- on other continents, not only in the um, in the U.S. So it is of great interest to to help. 
people of every generation to to find uh, find this organ art and uh, maybe uh, bring the organ art wherever they are for example for pianists right uh, for other exactly. uh, majors as well so um, I'm I'm very very glad that AGO finally uh, had decided to to do this in video because video is very big now and of course uh, uh, you, uh, Dan, being uh, the pioneer in multi multi teaching organ in multimedia, uh, I remember uh, many years now I, I stumbled across uh, your organ tutor 101, right? Uh, uh, where you it's teach. been many years. That, that thing was put together in 1995. Fantastic and still is very valid. I still remember uh, listening to you on MP3 and uh, you talk about the the polished mode and shortcut mode, right? And this is well, it's, I, it is helpful. polished. So, several look at it and think, now what's polished about this mode? <laughs> I see. <laughs> But it's extremely helpful. It makes this complex subject of playing the organ so so understandable and comprehensible for 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 pianists, for example, who need to jump right in and uh, start playing uh, within the month, probably in in exactly. churches. Exactly, and that's mm-hmm. one of the big things that we try to do with Organ Tutor is is make it easy for people uh, on their own. I mean, not that they would learn everything on their own, but to do as much as they can on their own to use mm-hmm. hyperlinks to any time when there was a term that came up that I thought might be confusing for a new organist, we hyperlinked it and either took it to a new page so that they could have a thorough explanation or had a simple uh, pop-up dialog box come up that would say, well, what does this term really mean? I think I was reacting to what it was when I was a student when I'd sit in a lecture and I'd hear these terms fly by my, my ears and I didn't know what they meant. And uh, I thought, there's nobody that's going to have that problem who learns around me because I want to make sure that they understand or at least have the opportunity to do so. So, Dan, uh, can you tell us a little bit, how did you first uh, fell in love with the organ? Do you remember the, those early days? Who introduced <laughs> you to the pipe organ and uh, what's the story? I, I certainly do remember those days. I remember as a, as a pre-teen looking up at what in that in our church at that time it was an old electronic organ and it wasn't inspirational at all so I had no interest in those days however I remember listening to uh, Tabernacle Choir broadcast and listening to Alexander Schreiner play and now that was that was intriguing and I'd listen during our during the LDS general conferences and 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 elsewhere I'd, I would hear him play and that was intriguing and it but it wasn't until I was 13 that that I decided to take a 12-week course about organ playing, and uh, it was it weekly classes that we had, and that brought me in. There was a new 17 uh, rank pipe organ in our church, and it, that course was essentially a kind of a celebration of that new organ and a chance to maybe inspire some new organists to learn, and that's exactly what it did for me. I, I was hooked after I was 13, although I didn't take private study and do serious study until I got to college. And of course, uh, you are now inspiring other people, right? Like uh, somebody else inspired you, and you're continuing this uh, tradition of, of inspiration. Do you think that people should uh, try to inspire each other as well uh, as they are progressing into organ performance art? Oh, that's. I think if there's one thing that I've learned uh, that's been most impactful in my teaching here at BYU, uh, when I've been trying to teach teachers is that our main job, even more important than disseminating information and teaching concepts and the like, is to motivate. Mm-hmm. If someone is not motivated, then they are simply not going to learn any longer. It will, it will go away very soon. So I think inspiring one another and motivating one another to keep going is the key. Right. And, of course, uh, availability of, of the tools of the materials of the uh, practice uh, um, basically help uh, is is very uh, may, uh, is a b- very big part in in this right if you live uh, in a remote area and you cannot find a good organ teacher or any uh, practice material or even any organ it's it's it will be quite difficult right to to oh absolutely to someone learn. Yeah, once someone's motivated, then they have to take the next step, which is, okay, how can I do this thing that I really want to do? And I, that's one thing we have to get a lot better at, mm-hmm. is 
is empowering people who don't have access to too many tools, who maybe don't have the money available to take private lessons every week. Uh, we need to empower those people to do as much as they can on their own, and then they will find a way. If they, if they really want to, they're going to find a way to fund those lessons because uh, there are scholarship programs. There are people out there. I know several of them personally who would, who would uh, do everything they could financially to help someone who's a new organist and who has that, that uh, burning desire to help them get what they need. Yeah, and uh, personally, myself and my wife Osha also experienced this this great help from our uh, organ professors Pamela Reuter Finstra and George Ritchie and uh, and Quentin Faulkner. You know all of them probably uh, in person, and they did great personal effort. To, to to empower us to study right and not only to us but to everyone else in their studios as well so I think uh, the generosity of uh, sharing ideas and empowering other people to to uh, motivate others also is a, is a key right and and it helps to move our uh, organ art forward exactly and I think there are quite a few people out there who may not they may be retired or they may not have a position where they can, where they have flocks of people coming to them every day saying, how can I learn this? I think there are lots of people out there who would do that if they were given a forum, if they were given an opportunity. And so that's what I see as might be really a, a new function of the, of the chapters is to increase these, I would call them, uh, I don't know what the right word is, but latent people, these people out there who have desire and who have time but they just don't yet have the uh, forum or the, the mm -hmm. system set up where they can really help one another. Exactly. And now the, the techn technolo technological uh, advances is, are so great that it's, um, the gap between technology and creativity is very, very, very narrow. You, if you have some ideas and if you want to share them, you don't need to be an IT person. You don't need to study computer science, right? You just, basically, many, many things are as simple as sending an email today. Yes, exactly. I've, I've got a very good friend who uh, is over 80 years old, uh, who absolutely loves the organ, who did not start organ training until she was 50. And now she's been going all these years and uh, she spends quite a bit of time on Facebook getting, uh, really making connections that otherwise she wouldn't have. And that is great on so many levels. I mean, she, be, she stays motivated by making these connections. In, I mean, th this lady is not a, a, a tech guru, mm -hmm. but she, uh, she loves the organ and she loves connecting with people. And this gives her the way to do that. Mm -hmm. And it's just a couple of key clicks. Uh, and she's there. Right. And of course, uh, when your students, for example, are required to to interview other organists, right? Sometimes exactly. I, know, I know you teach pedagogy classes and one of your students uh, interviewed myself. So I was very delighted that you had this initiative in, in young people's mind that uh, this idea that they should... Uh, uh, be first to reach out and and uh, try to connect with others. Uh, it's it's very very empowering I, 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 when you see the the young generation going forward. Uh, how did you come up with this uh, idea of of interviewing other organists? Well, when I was a student, uh, I was good friends with Doug Bush, mm -hmm. who became my colleague here at BYU, and who just uh, just a little less than three years ago passed away. But uh, Doug. I asked Doug several times, I said, what, what can I do? I, I, wanted, I wanted this very job I was in. Mm -hmm. I knew chances were very slim, but I wanted a job like this. <clears throat> and I said, what are the things I can do? And he gave me a couple of hints. But the number one, I think, in there that I recall most prominently was to network. I had to network. I had to get out there and make friends, make contacts, keep in contact with these people. And this is what was so delightful about Houston this last week, is I saw young organists doing this very thing. They are networking, they're making connections that, who knows what, which of those connections in the future are going to be of great value to them in finding jobs and finding whatever kind of activity they wish in the organ world. Right. I think uh, the key here is to help other people, right? Like, uh, like uh, 
like in your uh, organ pedagogy classes, students are required to interview an organist, right? Uh, Absolutely. Uh, and uh, this is a great or uh, help for that organist to, to have this conversation online. And uh, of course, many organists are eager to, to share their ideas, but don't have this platform don't you know nobody really uh, talks to them about those professional matters but your your student uh, takes initiative and contacts other people and this is a great help and opportunity for that organist right so the I key think i think so. is, is to help be yep. helpful and this is what i think what my students are finding out is <clears throat> that that personal connection from teacher to student or from from organist to organist those connections are as important as anything that we do if we wish to be active in the organ world. I, I think those interviews have been, of course, I make my students share them with one another in a binder that they take with them after the course is finished. But I think I've got my eye on taking those, some of those interviews and, uh, and getting approval from those who gave the interviews to put those up on the new organist website because... Those could be those could be really inspiring and informational to those people. Exactly. Imagine you you have uh, how many students do you have in your studio? By the way, we have uh, sixteen organ majors here uh -huh. at BYU right now. That includes uh, graduate students, a couple, and uh, we have fourteen who are uh, undergraduate organ majors, most of them performance majors. Right. And uh, how many interviews each student is required to do in your they class? They have to do, let's see, one, two, three. They have to do two interviews in each one of those courses. Right. One, one needs to be a, someone locally who is not necessarily an organ teacher, but just a teacher. And then the other one has to be somebody outside of our state Uh, going out and finding someone like you or somebody like uh, my one of my old professors back at Kansas, uh, James Higdon, or somebody like that. Right. And imagine uh, 16 people interviewing other uh, people. It's like 32 new interviews, right? And exactly. uh, it's, it's, uh, all of a sudden, it's a great teaching material because out of these interviews, uh, great uh, practice help can be found, right? Uh, and uh, yep. uh, if you put them online, everybody, not only AGO members, uh, but other uh, people can be inspired and, and uh, uh, motivated by it. And as you say, uh, it can attract new members to AGO too. Yeah, I think so. I think there's a lot out there that needs to be made available uh, globally and we have such an easy forum to do that now that and that's one of my jobs in this next year is to populate that web page with things that could be very useful to these new organists right and maybe uh, it will also uh, help uh, uh, people to um, empower themselves uh, to think beyond the liturgical playing also. Maybe they will uh, try to, I don't know, play a concert here and there uh, once in a while because you never know. Uh, maybe right now they are hesitant, right? They are limited. Maybe they are pianist. But if, if, if your materials uh, show that little by little, step by step, you can advance and prepare more advanced uh, repertoire, more concert uh, um, uh, repertoire, then... Who knows, maybe even pianists can learn uh, a traditional organ repertoire and uh, play for public, right? Exactly. We have a, a program here where we call it Music 115, Basic Organ Skills, and we have a room upstairs that has, 50, uh, has 12 uh, electronic organs in it, uh, and our university has about 34,000 students, and every semester about a <clears> hundred <throat> of those students enroll in basic organ skills and are coming through trying to learn the very basics. They're all pianists and they're, and I ask them, I, we, we interview, well, we have them fill out a questionnaire every single, uh, every single time they register for the course. And the, qu the question comes in that, uh, in, in that uh, questionnaire, why are you enrolling? And they say two things overwhelmingly. Number one, In the LDS church, there are no paid organists, mm -hmm. so they, are, they fear that they're going to be asked to be an organist, and uh, uh, so they want to be be well prepared. They don't want to look at this monster with all these buttons and knobs and, and tabs and keyboards. They don't want to feel like they don't know what they're doing, so that's the number one reason. The other reason is just for their own in interest and curiosity. It's a very powerful instrument. They may have heard uh, a really great performance and been, in, and been impressed by it. But 
in that in that area, we sometimes have students from that group organ program uh, come along and become organ majors. Mm -hmm. Someone who just finished her degree last week, her master's degree, started in music 115, and then became a very fine organist, became a uh, a guest organist at the Salt Lake Tabernacle, and uh, became one of our TAs. Did a great job, and uh, it happens. Right, and of course uh, uh, the. It's specifically related to LDS, right? Uh, issue that that the organists are not paid, right? So the motivation to practice and to play the organ has to be internal, and exactly. that is not very bad idea to to have this internal motivation. I'm not saying that organists should not be paid at all, you know, um, generally speaking. But but uh, motivation internal, I think, should come first. And in your case. Uh, you, students have that, right? Well, exactly. And the, the, the fact is, if it, any professional organist, if they look back and think about the number of hours they spend preparing for this job, it's pretty low-paying profession, even at best. Mm -hmm. So there has to be that fire inside first to, to love the instrument, to love the sound, to, to conquer a piece first. Right. Then, then they get to a point where hopefully they, they can uh, achieve a, a sort of income either through teaching or performing uh, church service, whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, another motivation, as you say, is uh, basic curiosity. It's another uh, pr probably qu the great quality that any organist should have, not only about the music and composers, but about the instrument as well. Because... Uh, I don't know if there is any more advanced instrument and more intricate instrument as pipe organ. Exactly. We've got some uh, a real advantage with the organ with uh, the very young people. Uh, when an elementary school uh, group comes and sees an instrument, they are just their eyes are wide open. They are so curious and interested in this great instrument. The ones who are technically oriented look at the mechanism and they think nothing more than wow. Nothing less than wow. They're just overwhelmed by how, how interesting it is. And those who are musically uh, interested will be uh, intrigued by the power of the instrument. And sometimes those little quick visits as young people will uh, bear fruit later on as they come to the instrument and say, maybe, I really, maybe since my legs can reach the pedals, I might be able to play that thing. Right. And uh, even, even if they can't reach the pedals, now there are... Uh, pedal extensions, right? That Wayne Leopold uh, uh, produces or at least uh, makes available. Uh, when you put uh, two um, two extensions on two keys, right? Uh, for example, tonic and the dominant, and you can play a basic sounding organ piece from the very very early age. Yes, I, I think that's great. It's a perfect way of thinking out of the box. Uh, to, to do something like that. It, we think, well, how can you possibly have uh, a pedal extension on every key? Well, you don't need it. Right. And just to have, just to have a couple like that uh, really helps, and then it can motivate a young person to really dig into that piece. It will take probably some years before a, a child like this will, will learn BWV 532. Remember this D major <laughs> scale? Yep. <laughs> so they don't need to worry about uh, reaching uh, s at least seven, right? Uh, That's or, right. Uh, or eight uh, yeah. different I, pedals. I know some people right now whose main interest is, is introducing uh, the very young people to the organ, the, the uh, preteens. Mm -hmm. And, uh, boy, if that can become successful and just focusing on manual work for the time being, that could be a, a big, a big uh, push to getting the organ out there for folks. So, uh, what do you think, Dan, uh, is uh, is sort of interesting for uh, for any uh, teen uh, or preteen uh, person, young, basically a youth, right, about the organ? What motivates mm -hmm. them to 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 take uh, lessons or start playing? Besides right. complexity of the instrument, of course. Right. Well, I think we we who are organists now look back and. Uh, perhaps realize that the things that intrigued us to the organ may have become what now to us are rather superficial. Uh, I remember a couple of pieces, and I guess I won't uh, mention which pieces they were or who the performer was, but uh, I, I received an LP from my grandmother when I was uh, about 11, mm -hmm. and I loved this thing. I just listened to it over and over. You know, those who don't know what LPs are, they're great big CDs. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, <laughs> but anyway, I got a I got this LP and I just loved it to death. And and now, one of 
one of those pieces has become one of my favorite pieces still, and another has become one that I am a little tired of hearing. But I recognize how much it motivated me and how much they still motivate a young person. So a young person today seems to be attracted to loud and fast music, to uh, music that has a melody, uh, things that are familiar. And, boy, I respect that. I, I think we, we who are more advanced with organ need to let our hair down a little bit and, and just make sure we don't uh, shun the music that inspired us when we were younger. Music that's loud and fast, music that just maybe is simple harmonically, simple contrapuntally. Mm-hmm. People are really drawn to that when they're young, and they will grow into the other stuff as well. Right. We just need to give give them time and uh, meet them yep. where they are, right? And, exactly. Uh, get the them. milk first, then the meat. Exactly. <laughs> and get only one foot in the door, right, as I say. Yep. And, and they will be grateful uh, that we care, that we care to help them grow, basically. And they, they will finally find the classical organ repertoire as well later on, I think. Certainly. So, so, so Dan, uh, when you are putting the new materials, video materials uh, for the new organist, uh, do you think about those things also? Um, uh, what to teach? What kind of uh, um, what kind of uh, uh, difficulty level there is? Can you tell us a little bit about your program? Yes, I I'll tell you how we determined our topics. We have a list of about forty topics for some of the first videos that we produce here. Uh, the way that I found these topics was to survey our group organ students one semester. So I had all of my TAs send out this survey to everyone and, and to ask, uh, what, what are you most interested in learning this semester? This was before they had any classes, basically. Maybe I have one or two classes. What, what do you really want to learn? Mm-hmm. We took all of those topics that came and we boiled them down and categorized them and, and used those topics for our uh, – our list of, po- of possible topics for these videos and the f- these first six or seven videos that are up now are some of those topics things like uh, how you know Fred Homan came up with this delightful humorous video about on the general cancel what does that do they wanted to know mm-hmm. I mean w- us organists think well you don't have to have a, a lesson or a video to learn about the general cancel well, there's a two-and-a-half-minute video that's humorous, fun, and tells you just what you need to know about the general counsel, and you may never need to learn it again. Right. So it's just, just perfect. There's a lesson about how to, how, to do, how to learn how to use your feet. There's uh, the very beginnings of using your feet. There's a rather, lo- a rather long lesson on solo and accompaniment registration. So lots of different possibilities. That, that one's the longest one of all. It's about 15 minutes long, and... Uh, the committee wanted me to wants me to cut that one down, but I just can't do it. So th- there's one long video in there. The rest of them are about two and a half to five minutes long. Mm-hmm. So we we found topics that would be of interest to a brand brand new organist. Of course, registration topic, as you mentioned, is is very very important. And I also feel uh, being in contact with with organists from around the world that it's under underserved this area is underserved of course there are books right on, on this subject baroque registration romantic and and you can buy uh, um, a special repertoire with special registration indications uh, of each country and period historical period you know like when leopold produces but uh, but uh, i think it's they are very very good if you have a teacher Right, and teacher right. can explain, the, make make those things easier to understand. Uh, so that's what they really need, uh, probably um, more more human like explanations for right. everyday person that uh, that can be adapted and um, uh, applied in practice. Because no, let's face it, not every organist will travel to Italy, right, and to play this <laughs> <laughs> this uh, old organ, you know, from the 1600, or right. or, or to North Germany, right. Um, right or even to Paris well, I, yeah right. exactly I think uh, I think w- one of the things I appreciate with modern technology is how easy it is to actually be able to hear the sounds that we talk about if you have a textbook about something that has to do with sound it's very difficult for a person who's reading that textbook and learning those concepts for the first time to grasp the concept what does a principle sound like 
If they're in their living room and there's no principal sound anywhere, how are they really going to know? So uh, one of the things we did on this web page is we made available the, one of the, the fundamental registration lessons in Organ Tutor. I just gave the whole organ registration uh, set of 10 lessons to the guild and we put that first lesson called uh, Introduction to the Organ Console right out on that free side of the website so that someone can click on something and see it mm -hmm. and see an explanation and even hear some of the things that are there. And then for members of the guild, the, the, other, nine the other 10 lessons are available to them also. And there are you know, probably 250, 300 audio clips so that if you want to hear the comparison between a flute a principle, a string, and a reed, you can do that with a click of a button instead of having to have someone demonstrate it for you. Um, you know, I know some people are concerned about trying to produce resources that would replace the teacher, but quite the opposite. What we're trying to do is empower people to learn as much as they can on their own in the ways that are best for technology to teach us. Technology can replace lecture, it can replace demonstration. But technology cannot replace the evaluation that a human can do. When they stand there and listen to you play and say, you know, you're not quite connecting those two tones. If you want to play a perfect legato, here's what it needs to sound like. Now try it. And then the student tries it. They don't quite get it. A computer cannot do that refinement. So let's leave the, the things that teachers do best to them so they can have more time to do that. And they can do as much as they can on their own at home. Right, and of course, computers can grade tests much more faster and easier than, than humans, right? But yeah. people can never be replaced with their generosity and care and doing things that matter. No kidding. Right. So I'm very grateful to you, Dan, that you are taking this initiative and bringing uh, the organ to the next generation of, of organists. Tell me this, uh, Dan, do you think there is a limit, age limit, where uh, the person can start organ playing? Uh, do you think that seniors also can start playing in their uh, free time? That's a very good question. Now, people like this woman who I met who started when she was 50, uh, th those kind of people blow my mind because, first of all, I have great respect for someone who will make changes like that later on in life. Uh, but, and she's done a great job. And, of course, there are limitations. She, she won't tackle the list B-A-C-H, um, but she will tackle any hymn. She'll tackle anything to play for prelude and postlude for a church service, and she'll tackle lots of things that she loves to do just for herself. Um, I did. This is another thing in my pedagogy teaching. Uh, we came across a specific line about about age and learning, and that was that uh, an older person can learn just about anything, but it may take a longer time to do so. So uh, we who are teachers need to realize that if we're working with somebody who's uh, up in years, be patient with those people. And let them know that you're there. You're going to be there next week and the week after. But uh, it may take them a little longer. And I have met a few seniors who could not get certain things. And that's fine. So we, we focus on what they do get, what they can, and take the joy in that and then move forward. That's that's 100% true, Dan. Uh, I had uh, um, this organ studio called uh, Unda Maris in Vilnius University. And uh, they... Uh, they are alumni and students and uh, basically faculty members of Vilnius University from various uh, majors and various sp specialties in various areas. Basically, we have uh, physics, uh, uh, we have uh, medical students, we have chemistry students, you name it, uh, linguistics, anything. So, basically, they are very curious people, basically, and they are attracted to pipe organ. And some of them are professors, professors with their students. They bring their students to the to the organ bench, and uh, you know, uh, a student is like like in their twenties, uh, uh, quite flexible and learns faster. Professor is not so fast, right? Uh, but he is <laughs> professor or she is professor in another field, a master in another field. So, mm -hmm. the, but but not an organ yet, uh, and they're sh a little bit shy to 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 do this in front of their student of their speciality but i think it's a great lesson for them because uh, because 
they, they can remember how they first started in their own field, right? L let's say in physics, right? And some, somebody else started in physics at the er early age and was a beginner at this, right? Like uh, myself, I don't, uh, can, I can't really understand the, the complexities of physics today as uh, <laughs> as best as they can. So they can teach me. So uh, when they practice organ, I always say that. Uh, you are an expert in another field, so use that knowledge in in organ performance p field. Uh, use uh, the tools that you, for example, how did you how did you learn the complexities of chemistry? Right. Remember those those complexities. Uh, how your uh, n n neurons in 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 your mind uh, created new paths? Uh, right. And the same mm -hmm. can be done in in organ. Uh, it requires new skills. Right. And that's exactly. that takes time, and that helps them to understand that yeah. little by little they can progress in organ as well. It probably helps them become a better teacher as well, because mm -hmm. because trying to learn a new topic and new skills like this will remind them how it felt to be to be brand new to something, and right. uh, maybe they can sharpen their skills as a teacher and grow a, a, a new empathy and a new understanding. Well, you used Dan, uh, the word uh, empathy, right? Which, which is, I think, a uh, key word uh, to understand how another person feels about your, your topic, your subject, your area. And uh, as organists, we don't always understand how our listeners feel, right? Uh, right. We, we, for example, we are in love with, with a great organ piece that we want to play and perform to others. But others are not in love with that piece yet, <laughs> right? It's so done. <laughs> How do you transfer this love or how do you advise people transfer this uh, passion for the particular area in organ playing to others who are not yet passionate so much? Well, you certainly hit the nail on the head. I think the more we learn as organists, the farther away we get, the further away we get with the uh, whole idea of our audience. And our audience doesn't see it the way we do. I think the best thing that we can do is when we're performing – take just a brief moment to help them to listen. Help them to know what to listen for. If it's in a program note, great. Or if you say, if you're in a kind of a performance where you can stand up and say, this is what I love most about this piece. Or this is what I think is genius about the creation of this piece. If you help direct this, the uh, listener's attention to what you love about the piece, they're going to be three times as apt to love the piece or to enjoy the piece than they would have been before. Right, Th those connections. Uh, when you talk about uh, the music that you play, that you're going to play, it's, 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 it's a key, right, to communicate the message that you're going to transfer to them. Uh, because um, not every listener or even minority of listeners will be educated in music, music, um, musical ideas that you know right, or I know, right? So we have to find a way, uh, another language probably, to, to communicate uh, the ideas behind the pieces, behind the music that we play. So, yep. so uh, to put it more specifically, for example, let's say we play a fugue. How do you, uh, how do you communicate the idea of the fugue with, uh, with lay audience? Well, it's nice to play, if you have the, the luxury to do so, to play the fugue subject for them. Tell them right. this is the theme, or we call it the fugue subject. And then you're going to hear this fugue subject 97 times throughout this piece. And then don't be shocked, it's not boring. In fact, it's quite interesting. Listen to what the, com the composer does. You'll hear it down here, you'll hear it up here, you'll hear it upside down. And you maybe even play it for him in inversion and say, listen for it when it comes upside down. Isn't that incredible that a composer would do that? So you, now they're primed to listen in a different way and they may enjoy it more. Or even uh, make them count the number of, of subjects, right, that, that they appear. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and then have, have a, a contest. A Who gets contest. closest at the end? <laughs> right. And, and have a prize, right, for the correct That's answer. That's right. Or incorrect answer, right? Right. <laughs> The, mo the most, uh, um, you know, brave the answer. The way. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's great. Fantastic. So uh, we, we, we touched on fugue. How about sonata form, for sonata, like, or symphony, a big piece like that? Yeah. Oh, I don't know. See if you, we, we could maybe uh, tell them, see if you can tell what, something as basic as see if you can tell when the adagio begins. See if you can tell when 
the end of this section or when the recapitulation occurs. Uh, raise your hands when the recap comes, and then they're all going to look around. Oh, why are they raising their hands? Oh, that's right. Here's the recap. Right, right, Maybe right. that's going to be of interest to them. And because uh, the sonata principle is the clash of two opposing ideas, right? Uh, yeah. Contrasting ideas. They need to listen t- for that contrast, right? And uh, to listen uh, when in the co- recapitulation, the, the second theme will appear in, in the home key, generally speaking, right? Uh-huh. So, uh, so cla- in classical sonata. So that takes another degree of, of uh, hearing, right? Uh, so do you think that um, air training is helpful for, uh, for a musician and for organist specifically uh, in this case? Oh, there is, there's no question that uh, for one to train their ear for so many reasons uh, in performance, uh, there, we'll have those moments when uh, we're, oh, I don't know, when we'll lose the, our place on the page or something, and we'll need to use our ear training. We'll need to need our ears to tell us where to go. Uh, of course, in improvisation, uh, having a good sharp ear uh, is is absolutely a must. Uh, there's no question, and, and and getting that ear training early on is something that the Americans need to really grasp. Uh, I have a student here in my studio from Hungary, and he. Uh, he was just born and reared on the concept of ear training and of course he's a top student here in my studio because he has those advantages so, so yes, of course, today with technology, you can make uh, uh, special videos and courses in air training specifically geared towards organists, right? Um, <clears throat> basically make them a differentiate between a specific organ stops and 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 maybe play dictations i don't know to, uh, let them write uh, write down the melodies that you play on the organ sounds right it's, it's it's in organ in organ registration one of the things i teach my students is that we really should register our pieces before we pull even one stop mm-hmm. we ought to hear the sound in our heads and even in my first semester in that, that group organ course i i have a little assignment where i have them listen now that they've gone through all the lessons about registration, I have them listen to uh, sounds and ask them specific questions about it. Uh, and I tell them that the, the idea is if we want a solo, we should have in mind before we register, do we want to read there? Do we want a soft flute? Do we want a two and two thirds and an eight? Uh, or do we want a full cornet? Have that in mind before you even pull a stop. And it makes our job as an organist and as a register, uh, as a one who registers at the organ, much much simpler. And that is a great form of ear training specific to organists. Mm-hmm. And of course, it, ta- it saves lots of time, right, on the organ yeah. bench uh, when you prefer for for church service or recital. You can do this ahead of time at home, even yep. on the on the table, right? Uh, yep. Listening or looking at the score and imagining the sounds that you will going to use, right, on the target organ. Yes, absolutely. That's got to be, uh, for anyone who cares about saving time and using it wisely, using it uh, efficiently, uh, having the sounds in our head, at least the general sounds, before we get to the organ bench are, is a very useful skill. Fantastic. So, so Dan, um, uh, ooh, ooh, ooh. Can you tell us a little bit uh, where they can find our listeners, where they can find you and your work online, your new page, for example? Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the easiest way to find the new organist page is go to the AGO webpage, which is agohq.org, and then go to the education tab, and then click the new, or- the new organist link, and then the page comes up. I'll make make sure I'll include this link into the description of this conversation as well so that people can easily find it online. Thank you very much. uh, Thank you so much, Dan, for your uh, generosity of sharing ideas, for doing the work that matters. Uh, Before we close this conversation, can you tell our listeners just one thing? What did you wish you knew before you started organ playing? Before I started playing at all? Yes. What was the number one thing you wish you knew? I wish, before I, I, I wish that I had been even more uh, thoroughly prepared in terms of uh, creating music without the score. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was taught 
I was taught, uh, I was brought along with some theory papers. Every week I had to do some theory papers, and I learned music theory uh, early on, and I appreciated that. But as far as actually having someone coach me there in how to create music right at the keyboard, how to improvise, I think that would have been a lot more joyous for me as a, as a youngster. I loved learning the literature, but I, I did not explore as far as I would now have liked to actually creating music uh, at the keyboard on my own. Do you think, Don, that uh, learning new music helps you to understand how to create your own as well? Oh, certainly. Le learning the literature is, is uh, I mean, that, that's probably the number one thing we should do, is learn the great masterworks, even though they may be simple masterworks. Mm -hmm. uh, learn those, and then, then we have a reference point. These, uh, I'm afraid these people who, they call themselves self-taught, who never really learn the literature, they just have a good ear, they're missing out so much. Yet, they're, they certainly have, have one thing that I wish I had, and that was an earlier uh, introduction to the idea of improvis improvising and, and, and creating music. But how about a nice uh, combination of both? How about learning the literature and, and having teachers who will, at the same time, really inspire us to create music on our own and coach us in that? And if they don't like what we did, say, what, did, what was it that you could have done better? Uh, and we as teachers can do the same thing. We can, we can commit ourselves to spending that five to ten minutes in an organ lesson in helping that person to create music on their own, uh, using a template, if they will, using whatever tricks that teacher has to help them to create music. It's, there's so much joy in that. Fantastic. I will say amen to that. And uh, I will um, wish you a fantastic new year, brave year ahead of you. Ahead of you. And, uh, and keep, uh, keep pushing the boundary of what's possible, okay? And uh, okay. keep inspiring other people. And uh, let's hope that your students uh, will begin inspiring others as well. Thank you so much for inviting me. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Dan. You too. And take care and we'll keep in touch. All right. Thanks so much. If you liked this conversation, I encourage you to visit my blog Secrets of Organ Playing at organduo.lt where you will find lots of insights, practical advice and training for every area of organ playing. You can subscribe to this blog for free to get your daily dose of inspiration and to be the first to know when any of my future podcasts roll out. I hope to help you reach your dreams in organ playing. I'm Vida Spinkavitus. Thanks for listening. And I'll catch you online really soon.